So we are on, um, Sonia and Juan Carlos. And of course, uh, I invite all our guests uh, to make your questions uh, through the chat. We can do that. Uh, we have uh, about, uh, I don't know, uh, Juan Carlos, half an hour, 45 minutes. I think also Miguel would know. Jose Miguel, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, we have until uh, 12.30. Okay, hour, hour and a half. <laughs> uh, hour, yeah, hour and a half, one hour. Very good, very good. Um, my first, let me ask for, uh, with a question. Um, let me start with a question for, for Sonia uh, regarding the title. I have my own interpretation, but I would like to hear yours. Um, why the vertical border? Because borders are, especially this one, horizontal. Yes, thank you, uh, Alejandro. Uh, well, first of all, um, thank you uh, for this opportunity to be here to uh, present this film and um, have this conversation uh, with all of you and also with the um, with the audience. Uh, the vertical border, we decided uh, on this title uh, precisely because we wanted um, uh, to offer this film as a way of uh, of rethinking uh, migration, but also uh, the nature and the purposes of borders. So, of course, we tend to think uh, of borders as uh, as uh, horizontal structures, uh, very often perhaps simple lines. But when we actually get closer to borders, we see that they're quite different. That they're actually uh, more extensive. That they're really uh, border zones. This is a term that is quite often used um, uh, at the U.S.-Mexico border, for example. Uh, and of course, um, uh, as one might uh, uh, see, also in in Central America. Um, especially when we talk about uh, gang controlled neighborhoods, uh, there are also um, uh, different kinds of borders and they're known as invisible borders. So these are just uh, some examples, but why did we want to talk about um, a vertical border? This is because really, um, uh, what we see stretching from the United States uh, south, not only through Mexico, but also um, to, to Central America and even uh, further south, even reaching uh, into South uh, America. So uh, the, the film focuses on uh, on what happens to uh, migrants from Northern Central America. Uh, and so the focus is on uh, on Mexico, but we might also say that this is really um, a global issue, not just the, uh, the displacement, but also the border constructs uh, that, that we wanted uh, to show here. Uh, so we can think about borders in, in very different ways, but uh, in the case of Mexico, we wanted to talk about uh, the vertical border, not just because um, migrants face obstacles when they actually uh, try to cross uh, different uh, borders between the countries, trying to get out of Mexico, trying to get into Mexico, um, sorry, out of Central America into Mexico and into the United States, but also um, the obstacles that really uh, exist along uh, what we call this vertical border. So. Um, with this uh, idea of the vertical border, we wanted to draw attention uh, what is happening to migrants, not just um, in terms of uh, migration controls, because this, this vertical border is really an instrument uh, of deterrence, a way of keeping uh, unwanted migrants out, uh, out of Mexico, but especially out of the United States. Um, but it was also a way for us to show that um, this uh, migration deterrence goes beyond the formal migration uh, apparatus that perhaps we uh, we tend to think about. So Mexico uh, is an interesting uh, example because uh, much more is happening to migrants, not just uh, formal um, migration controls. We, we saw images uh, of uh, immigration agents, also um, uh, members of the armed forces, the National Guard, who have become much more involved in migration control. But uh, we were also trying to show that um, migrants have become caught up in, in what is called the drug war in Mexico. So of course, uh, the drug war itself was not uh, launched as a, as a strategy against migrants, but uh, the violence that exists in Mexico has this, uh, this additional deterrent effect uh, on migrants. So if we um, want to compare um, 
uh, the the discomfort and the the um, the experiences that that um, uh, irregular migrants have in the United States. Something that uh, has often been commented uh, in in the U.S. context is um, when when people are in detention centers and they experience very cold conditions. Yeah, like the the ice box. So this is uh, just another example of what states are doing to make uh, the migration experience very unpleasant for migrants. So unpleasant that people will remember it, and when they are when they're being deported, that they will not not try to repeat this journey yeah and this this um deterrent effect of course also uh, is meant for uh, for other migrants who have not yet attempted uh, this journey so if we go back uh, to mexico uh, the drug war also has this effect simply because um migrants uh, transit uh, uh, different parts of mexico in order to to reach the border uh, with the united states uh, and by doing so, they also um, uh, transit territories that are controlled by, by criminal groups who fight among each other, but who are also uh, who also have a conflict uh, with the, the Mexican state. So this is really the idea uh, of the, the vertical border. Uh, this film um, does not just want to um, uh, perhaps to uh, to shape our uh, our perspectives on on migration to tell a story about why people need to abandon their homes, but also especially to show how states um, react uh, to uh, to those forced migrants. Very nice. Yes, my my interpretation perhaps was is is a little more um, philosophical, in the sense that um, verticality is blind. When you see worries, uh, when you see problems or issues in a vertical manner, you only see it one way and clearly this, and, and you don't see things. So for me, it's uh, one of the messages of your film is that immigrants are invisible, unexistent. And uh, that comes with verticality. When you, th when you see things horizontally, it, it's uh, meaning in a, democratic way, you have different perspectives and you can, you can understand a problem from a three, three, uh, 360 grades um, angle. Uh, and, and, uh, and the other option is only to see it vertically. But I, I would like to have uh, the point of view of uh, Juan Carlos Gomez. Uh, what do you think first of, of the film, uh, Juan Carlos? I think that <clears throat> there was one great contribution that I truly, truly appreciated in the film. And that is that you gave a face and a voice to so many kind and amazing people at shelters uh, and who advocate for uh, not just uh, individuals, but for sort of groups of individuals um, in a sort of a no-win situation, uh, whether it's the 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 shelter that helps the people from the monster, the train, or the or the on the border, understanding the different populations, the complexity. You put a face on it so that other individuals um, who normally would not be out there, who would not be acknowledged, uh, the doctors without borders, uh, that they're out there in the group that's out there in the field, and in. in the fact that you also, there was something you did that uh, reminded me of a constant com com problem that we have, not just in these three countries, but that we experience with many people from almost every single country, and that people forget uh, history. Uh, I remember uh, having a conversation uh, with a young uh, guerrilla fighter who was here in the US seeking asylum we were actually on a Saturday night having a conversation at a bingo hall in a Catholic church where he was seeking legal services. And one of the things that he said was that he left because he got tired of poor on poor crime in what he said he didn't understand. The sons and daughters of the, uh, of the negotiators and of the leaders of his movement uh, and, the, um, and the sons and daughters uh, and the leaders of the government side were living in these, wonder, well, these wonderful lives while he was starving, hitting people up for food in the middle of the night with an AK-47 
and it, 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 it reminded me of my goodness uh, that history he remembers it he must be uh, 30 some years older now and one of the th tragedies that exist is that people have forgotten that there have been wars the history of persecution uh, and by showing this film you keep that alive and it is so important that we not forget uh, and, and it's an extremely important function of this film to show especially uh, the history of, of macro repression in the atrocities committed in, in these countries, understanding that atrocities is, uh, are, are committed, of course, throughout the world tragically. But in these countries, one of the things that happens is that uh, here uh, in Miami, uh, we constantly speak um, to people. On Saturday, we had, uh, we expected about 40 people at a Nicaraguan church, we got over 400 asking for help. And the thing is that it reminded me of the people at the shelters that you filmed and that you allowed them to tell their stories. And the answer is, how? How are we going to help these people? Because unless you shed light on this situation, as you've done, uh, then the story dies. And it's there are just more mass numbers reported uh, in some government statistical report in the bureaucracy. And people forget. One of the greatest tragedies that I see is how immigrants actually easily take on the position of closing the door behind them. Uh, and they forget that they themselves had a privilege that was hard fought for. I think of Salvadorans and in, uh, in Guatemalans during the American Baptist Church settlement and the opportunity, a second chance to get a work permit to survive uh, during the war years later, a chance to get residency. And one of the frustrations in, uh, that those of us in the field experience is, my goodness, there are so many of these situations that could be avoided today. Um, so many people who could have petitioned for their loved ones, uh, but they didn't. Who could have used the tradition, you know, the, 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 the limited legal system that exists, they could have done it and it didn't happen. And the thing is though that only by you raising consciousness and you showing uh, the problems that that people face, the, the horrors that they experience along their journey, um, I think I think it's important that you. It's an important film, uh, understanding that uh, the the border itself. Uh, one of the things that I thought about the title when you said a vertical border, I interpreted it differently, because in the Trump administration there was always this idea that he didn't really need to build physical walls because they had built a bureaucratic wall. Uh, and that the bureaucratic wall was so unsurmountable that you go ahead. Um, if you make it here, you're still, we're going to make your life. And to this day, there is an anti-immigrant movement that makes life almost illegal. You can't drive, uh, you can't work. Uh, you basically are, are, are tied down by state level laws, by federal laws that in, in many ways are just tools of the anti-immigration movement. Um, and so um, that's when you said, uh, when, I, when I read your title, I was like, oh, okay, that's what was meant. I'll be quiet since maybe you might want to say something. Do you have any comment, uh, Sonia? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, perhaps uh, just to uh, to respond to your uh, last comment, um, I think certainly there are, there are many um, many concepts, many different ways of thinking about what happens uh, to migrants. Uh, and actually, um, uh, Todd Miller, when when he talked about what is happening at the U.S.-Mexico border, he also explained uh, the smart border, which is something that the Biden administration has really uh, promoted. So there are certainly um, lots of things going on. But when you mentioned um, the bureaucratic wall, uh, this is uh, very relevant also in um, uh, in Mexico. And I, I don't want to sound um, too general and not to subsume um, all these different things that are happening under under this term, uh, the vertical border. Yeah, um, but I think um, if we, uh, I, I mean, it is also related to um, 
really to um, to the shape of the Mexican territory because simply this is how uh, how we can uh, see Mexico on a uh, on an actual map. So it, it makes sense to talk about. Um, this border that that really extends uh, through the Mexican uh, territory, but I, I would not want people to uh, again to to think of the vertical border simply as as one uh, simple line that is um, that is extending through Mexico, but um, this is a border that is also branching out into different parts uh, of Mexico. So uh, the bureaucratic wall uh, also um, is part of this vertical border that, that exists uh, in Mexico. Um, because what we've seen uh, over uh, almost a, a decade is that uh, as people have realized that it's become uh, harder uh, to enter the United States uh, because of the, the dangers and uh, also the, the, the costs that is associated with the border crossings, more people uh, have turned to, uh, to asylum uh, applications. Yeah, And so this is um, uh, another uh, difficulty that we see now in uh, in Mexico, because the uh, the agency that we also um, showed in the film, uh, the Coma, um, is really uh, overwhelmed with uh, with asylum uh, ap applications, and it, it's um, it's interesting also to uh, to follow this uh, a little in, in social media, because the uh, the head of the agency uh, who who we interviewed uh, for the film, uh, he often speaks of this um uh, uh of this uh uh really of this uh a sharp increase in in asylum uh, applications, but this is only part uh, of the story. So of course, the the number of asylum applications in Mexico has increased uh, as people have found it more difficult to get uh, into the United States. Uh, but the other um, part uh, of the story really has to do with the the nature of the asylum system um, uh, in Mexico. And so uh, we, we could compare this to to other countries. Uh, I'm from Germany. And uh, in, in my own country, uh, there is a more, uh, a more robust uh, asylum system. So people can, can apply for asylum and throughout this process, uh, there will be housing and there will be uh, other supports uh, for, uh, for the applicants, but this is not something uh, that exists uh, in Mexico. So what, uh, what Juan Carlos called uh, the bureaucratic wall, this is uh, uh, really being replicated uh, uh, in Mexico because people, um, most uh, certainly um, migrants who, who enter from Central America tend to be in uh, in one state, Chiapas. Uh, we showed what, what is happening in, in Tapachula. And so this is uh, where really um, uh, migrants are, are concentrated and where the, the, the sense of despair among migrants is really palpable and there have been hunger strikes and more 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 traumatic actions that are being taken now by by migrants because people uh, are so desperate uh, to find a, a solution to uh, to their problems but what happens they they can apply for asylum but then they don't know how long this process is going to take and because the the number of asylum uh, applications has increased so much this process uh, is now taking much much longer than it should take not six weeks but uh, several months even a year uh, is quite common and during this time uh, people don't have supports they're they are left to their own devices uh, having to find uh, housing and, and jobs and just generally also struggle to to access uh, health care so this is uh, i think uh, when you mentioned the, the bureaucratic wall is also important um, to bring this up in the in the Mexican uh, context because what we see really on the part of the United States and also Mexico is really uh, on on the one hand uh, this um, this rhetorical emphasis on on human rights that that migrants are being uh, rescued from unscrupulous uh, smugglers who try to bring them uh, to the United States uh, and so there's uh, in practice. Um, uh, on the other hand, this this emphasis on on intercepting migrants, on on detaining and deporting them, but there's uh, really um, very little that we see in in terms of really uh, giving people the the assistance and the protection uh, that uh, that forced migrants. Uh, need so all, all we see is really this, this emphasis on uh, on on border security and uh, 
keeping out migrants, but uh, if the United States does not uh, want to give uh, sanctuary to, to these migrants, even though I don't see any any uh, good good argument uh, for for doing so, um, the United States is. Uh, is supporting the the migration apparatus of, of Mexico, but it does very little to to support uh, this this other part to dismantle this bureaucratic wall uh, that that Mexican that migrants are struggling with in in Mexico. But but there is the other side though, which is a problem. We have a joke in my field, <clears throat> which is that the U.S. government should hire the cartels and the coyotes uh, to do their messaging. Uh, because uh, no matter what lawyer tells you, uh, you could have the most reasonable lawyer and the person will just smile and go and pay the smuggler and risk their lives, understanding that, uh, that you pay to get through different territories, but then also the smugglers also sometimes, as was mentioned by, I believe, the father, uh, the, the priest, he mentioned the idea of when people are then extorted. And one of the interesting things is that you're, you're running the risk of, of violence, sexual violence, of, of extortion. And then the family members freak out over here and uh, they go, oh, wait, wait, this is not, we had a business deal as if it was a, like I bought a car from you and we had a contract. And the answer is no, the smuggler really is not. Uh, it, it, there's no legitimate law in the eye of the smuggler. And for many years now, one of the problems that happened is the, or has happened and is continuing to happen. Um, you have also other groups um, that, for example, we, there, there are a couple of, not a couple, but many problems. One is uh, the children have become the key to the door in a way. So that uh, the message is because of the Wilberforce Act, which was meant to protect children uh, or because of the Flores settlement, um, they, there's this message that bring a child so that smugglers actually will have the mother with one child and the father with another, and in some instances, the rental of children as needed, um, which is supposedly going to get you out of custody faster. Uh, people tell you uh, what they think you want to hear to succeed in their claim. And so the thing is, though, that we, uh, we, one of the problems that happens is that the legitimacy of legal systems in different countries, it, 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 it's a big problem because the person's agenda, the person's goal is different than the bureaucrats, than the lawyer, than the immigration judge or asylum officer, than the politician, the politicians in different countries. And, and it's an interesting, complex situation. But what one of the problems is that this is not what asylum was about. And the problem is that we neither address the causes. One of the issues, I, I blame diasporas in every, from every single uh, immigrant producing country, because the thing is though that in part, uh, how much reinvestment, you have remittances to support family, but how much development is actually taking place in the different towns, uh, in the different villages to help populations. Um, I, I am so tired of domestic violence cases because my goodness, have we, how, how much more do we have to sort of tell people uh, this is a problem in the governments of these countries, but then also people. Uh, my favorite group here in Miami is a group of undocumented people against undocumented people because they're against irregular immigration, but they belong to a fundamentalist church that supports the Trumpist movement. And it's so cute to talk to them and you go, but didn't you break the law? And they go, no, 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 we're different. And so people choose to apply the law favorably to those they love. And it's not just the people from the Northern Cone. You have Cubans, you have Haitians, you have Venezuelans, you have this mass number. Right now, one of the problems at the Southern border uh, is that there's a Marielle going on through the southern border uh, in uh, Marielle Boatlift from 1980. Basically, uh, you have neighborhoods emptying out on this island in Cuba. And, uh, and so the question is, you have this 
mix of issues that the question is, how do we educate people and, and provide the resources to people so that we can have no need to do this? And there are many foundations that are really well-intentioned and people who have tried really hard to, it's basically called sort of not one more generation having to break up a family. Um, one of the things we saw in the surge from 2012 on or 2010, if you want, uh, was that mothers and fathers who had become banks instead of mothers and fathers, when the, when the children got here, you saw the reconstruction of a family and there was a tension that existed and it was it, tragic in some instances uh, because the thing was, wait, my grandmother is my mother. You just sent money and here you and the mom or the dad here would work six and a half days a week uh, to barely survive, to live in a house with various other families. And there was a fantasy of it in, in one of the songs that you had in the background of like what they promise you. Uh, and the answer is the reality of, oh my God, what do you mean I have to work as hard as I do to barely survive, to be exploited, to not necessarily be paid a fair wage, to live in a house that's, uh, that's not what I imagined you would live in. And, and so all of these complexities, uh, I think also impact the border in the sense of it's, it's um, your, your next documentary is uh, the miracle of, sol of solving this problem. And that, that was precisely what I, I, think, I was thinking. There's, a, there's a, another documentary, the sequel, to, to uh, explain uh, the immigration crisis or, or issue from the diaspora uh, perspective and the conflicted views that the diaspora has because there are some that support immigrants and others that reject them. So that, that's an interesting topic and something to think about, uh, Sonia. Uh, Thank we, you. <laughs> <laughs> you're so busy, I know. Uh, there's, this is a question from Jose Miguel. And he says, uh, you have been studying this issue for some time now. Uh, in the film, what impacted you the most and how is that portrayed in the film? Um, thank you. Perhaps um, for those uh, who, who are not familiar um, with, my, with my work, so I, I have been working um, on migration for some time, that is, uh, that is true, but I actually, um, I started out uh, with, the, with the gangs in Central America, especially uh, in El Salvador. Um, and looking at, uh, especially at uh, gang policies, eventually also led me uh, to look at uh, why why people are leaving um, Central America. And since I'm based in, in Mexico, of course, I had to um, I had to look at um, uh, at migration and what happens to to migrants uh, in Mexico. Um, but to respond to to Miguel's question, um, I, I think I have to say what what is. Um, uh, impacting for us is perhaps not so much what is what, what is portrayed in the film but what we what we didn't include uh, or what was uh, what was difficult to film so of course we were we were trying to incorporate uh, different elements not just um, as uh, as was touched on at the beginning the the historical part of the of the violence but also the migration that we're seeing uh, nowadays but also we wanted uh, initially to to explain uh, why is there forced migration? Why why would we show, why should we talk about this displacement in terms of forced migration, not economic migration, uh, perhaps? And then uh, we wanted to talk about uh, this migration uh, deterrence, um, but. Um, uh, th there were some uh, some challenges uh, involved in doing that uh, in Central America, but also uh, in Mexico. And perhaps um, what is um, what is what is difficult in that sense is knowing uh, what is happening uh, to to people uh, in Central America. Uh, especially uh, to people who live in, in gang controlled uh, neighborhoods, but also um, uh, in the case of Honduras, for example, uh, where um, where the poverty and the the corruption really affect um, uh, people and, and, and make life very hard for them. And also knowing uh, what then happens to people who have already um, experienced so much suffering and then um, 
knowing what is happening to them in uh, in Mexico. So the, the violence uh, is very much a part of uh, of people's life. But now, why why is this um, perhaps the, a difficulty? For, for filmmakers precisely because we, we wanted to um, to tell the story um, but we also had to be mindful of um, of the protection needs uh, of people we couldn't um, uh, jeopardize people's security not not in Central America and not in 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 Mexico and this this is why we relied more on uh, on interviews with uh, with observers and, and analysts and and practitioners people working in the shelters and people like Oscar Martinez uh, he has even done uh, this whole journey um, in, including uh, writing uh, the beast uh, through Mexico. So we, we wanted to speak to all these individuals as a way of, of driving this narrative uh, forward. And of course, uh, it would have been uh, interesting to show more images of, uh, of gang controlled neighborhoods in, in Central America, for example, and also to show um, perhaps more more directly of, of what is uh, what is happening to migrants uh, in mexico um but also uh, what we what we did include um thanks to the to the collaboration of uh, uh, of journalists who, who happen to witness uh, certain uh, certain experiences is precisely how uh, how migrants are being hunted down in in mexico so this 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 violence that that this repression that comes from the Mexican state when um, uh, migration agents, but also members of the National Guard really uh, run after chase migrants uh, and uh, and uh, assault them. So we, we were not able to show that much um, of, of what is happening. Also acts of, of corruption uh, would be very difficult um, to film, but we, we wanted to give uh, really um, an overview of the of the uh, migration experience, and I think through uh, the the various interviews, we we managed to to puzzle the story um, together. Yeah, but so uh, to respond to to Miguel's question, uh, I think what what causes an impact uh, uh, on those of us who um, who who study this and who would like to to tell the story is knowing uh, what is what is happening, uh, um, struggling with this difficulty of of finding. Um, um, a, a compelling, but also an aesthetically interesting way uh, of telling the story, but also um, uh, grappling uh, with the knowledge that um, that we we know what what is happening. So this is really we're we're, we're telling the story in a in a different way. But really, what's happening in Central America and uh, in in Mexico, and also the the reaction by the United States. Uh, this has been documented uh, already, but really, what is uh, what is um, what is difficult to to accept is that all this evidence has not changed uh, the policies, and so this is really um, ultimately what what led us to uh, to make this documentary because we wanted to to bring this information to people in a in a different way. Right, and and, and that you did pretty well uh, in synthesizing a very complex uh, issue in an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and 10 minutes where we get um, uh, different versions and perspectives uh, for the problem. So I would like to continue for, for a few minutes on your editorial decisions. Um, may, I have, of, may I ask Sonia a question also related to what she, what she was saying? Yes, yes, of course, Juan Carlos. Sonia, when the, the people you were able to let them present um, from the perspective of the shelter. They spoke in a way for those who you couldn't show because you would endanger them, whether it was the shelter that had the different modules uh, for the different populations, the LGBT, uh, the, the assorted other modules. Uh, how is, is this the vehicle you chose to give those populations voice? Because you, for example, you were able to show that uh, African, uh, African Central American uh, populations uh, that um, that populations that we that are almost sort of ignored uh, as if they did not exist in in, in Central America or Mexico, uh, and, and and you put them on the screen, and did you, I imagine you did this consciously. Yes, uh, we. we... 
we thought about um, what to include and what to what to exclude. Again, this is a, another um, difficult uh, decision because obviously the um, the migration experience and also the the, the migrant population is more uh, more complex. And so we, we weren't able uh, to discuss all the different uh, experiences. You just mentioned the, the LGBTQ population, um, also the, the experiences of, of women uh, are uh, uh, touched on more, more superficially, yeah. Um, but it would have, um, if we had tried to, to, to cover um, uh, all these different experiences, see the documentary would have been um, much longer and it's also, it, it wasn't meant to be uh, in academic work, even though the, the film is based um, or, or draws inspiration from, from the, the academic research we did um, previously, but we really, um, the, the, the first cut we had was longer, um, but we had to, uh, to leave out certain material in, in order to, to tell a, a coherent story and to um, perhaps to, to make a, um, to give a more simple message uh, for, for people who perhaps are not uh, uh, very familiar yet with the, with different concepts and with the, um, with the argument that, that we were trying uh, to make. Uh, also what happened, um, we had planned uh, this film and we, we knew what, what, what population and what, what scenes we were interested in, what we wanted to film. Uh, and then uh, of course this whole process uh, takes a while and not just see the, the, the planning, the, the development stage, but also the filming. And of course then afterwards see the editing also uh, takes a while. And so what happened uh, during the filming, we had decided uh, uh, from the beginning that we were going to focus uh, on Central Americans. Uh, this is, uh, Central Americans have long been uh, uh, an important part of the American population uh, in, in Mexico and the, the whole um, uh, irregular migration movement that, that is headed uh, towards the United States. But of course, this is only one, one example. We could have uh, focused on, on Haitian migrants or on African migrants. And of course, uh, there are also uh, other migrants who don't even stay at the shelters, who travel with the smugglers and who are, uh, who are less visible uh, to those of us who, who try to study um, migration movements. And so um, the, the pictures that perhaps seem a little uh, out, of, out of context when, when we see Haitian migrants, uh, the Haitian migrants who, who walk through the streets uh, of Tapachula, we also could have shown them in, uh, in Tijuana. This is really because the the circumstances changed uh, as, as the filming was already underway. So uh, we, we had um, limitations in terms of, of time and, and budget. Uh, if we had uh, more time, if it if we'd had more time and more resources, we could have spent uh, more time in, in certain locations and uh, do more filming uh, of uh, Haitian migrants, for example. Yeah. So, um, but what we did at the end was really a, a compromise. We we wanted to to focus on the Central Americans to tell a, a clear story about what is happening uh, in Central American countries, uh, as opposed to uh, Haiti or perhaps other countries. Even though the the drivers of forced migration are similar, but uh, different countries have their own histories and, and different. Uh, current uh, circumstances. So it would have been difficult to do justice uh, to these different uh, contexts. And so uh, this is uh, what we see is really a, a compromise between uh, the story that we, we wanted to tell, that we wanted to tell in a, in a compact manner. We also wanted to acknowledge that, of course, Central Americans are not the, the only um, uh, forced migrants who uh, who head uh, to to the United States. Really, this population is more uh, is more diverse, and it just so happened uh, uh, as the filming was underway that um, there were uh, uh, Haitian migrant caravans. Uh, but we uh, we didn't want to stray too much from from our original focus, so we decided to to include. Um, uh, some some images, but not to to do more interviews or to to cover also uh, the situation in in Haiti, for example. So this is uh, it's really it's it's one story, but uh, of course it's possible also to tell um, other stories about uh, forced migration and and migration deterrence. 
the, the you know that scene where you had I'm sorry I'm sorry yeah, that's fine that's fine that's fine okay. you you know that sort that that scene where that young woman she's discussing being how it's more dangerous to be a woman on the train her voice in that those few words that you got on film said so much uh, because in, in in that short uh, little line um, it, it 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 showed the dangers of being a woman uh, in, 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 on this journey and how much, I mean, vulnerable uh, women are, how much more vulnerable uh, young women are. Um, and, and, and just that little clip, it, it was amazing to listen to her voice because the tone of her voice alone, the, what, the, what, what you caught, said it all. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it was it was amazing. I don't know if you remember Alejandro. The Absolutely, and not only that, about the the mothers of immigrants that are lost in immigration or that are victims of uh, human trafficking. These uh, Honduran women that are, have organized through the years, looking and infiltrating um, these uh, these organizations, becoming uh, prostitutes, looking for their son or looking for their daughters. Their testimonies are amazing. And I saw the faces of this woman and the suffering of this woman and how uh, governments and authorities are not sensitive to their feelings. Um, when you are poor in Latin America, in Central America, in Mexico, and when you are poor and you are of indigenous descent, um, you basically don't exist. So your feelings don't exist. And um, if they would have only put their place in their side when you lose a son, a daughter, a granddaughter, things and policies change forever. And I think that uh, the documentary uh, does that uh, very, very well in portraying the sentiments and the drama of, of, of these families. Um, I would like to ask a question to, to Sonia, uh, more uh, related to editorial um, decisions. In the case of uh, El Salvador and Honduras, you interviewed two journalists, but you didn't interview any authority. And in the case of Mexico, you, the, the obviously the number of interviewers included some authorities from Comar, none from the Secretaría de Gobernación. Um, and uh, it was, it, it, my question is, was, uh, is um, was it challenging to interview authorities in these two countries, Honduras and El Salvador, and why? Uh, we, we try to uh, to include um, different perspectives. Of course, we we had a particular story we wanted to tell, an argument uh, we wanted to make. So, uh, the the question about editorial decisions is also uh, relevant in in that sense because even though we had uh, we had a clear focus for for all the interviews, um, the uh, the public officials. Um, you see in the film and those who ultimately did not agree to be interviewed for the film, um, they're, they are of course interested in, in sharing uh, their own view and they, uh, they do not necessarily agree uh, with the argument that, that we're making uh, in this film. So initially we tried uh, to, to branch out more um, than, than uh, what well, would have been uh, really feasible uh, for the film. Uh, as I said before, we had uh, really lots of material um, by the time we, we concluded the filming and we had uh, we had to be quite rigorous in uh, in, in cutting the material and so uh, some of the, the interviews were were very extensive and really you, you can only hear a few fragments really uh, in the uh, in the interviews but the, it was necessary to do this in order to uh, to tell uh, a coherent story and to be to be able to move up the vertical border and, and reach uh, the US Mexico border in uh, in not more than than 90 minutes that was really the the limit we had uh, established uh, from the outset so in terms of um, people we tried to speak to yes we we reached out uh, to many more individuals than than you uh, see in the film uh, we wanted to speak uh, to authorities also in, in Central America, but uh, we did not 
uh, we were not able to um, to obtain collaboration uh, from from authorities in in Central America. And at the end, uh, we decided to have Oscar Martinez and uh, Ismael Moreno, who are very, uh, very lucid uh, analysts and who are very familiar, um, not just with the uh, with the situation in, in their own countries, of course, but also with the uh, with the um, the challenges that that migrants are, are facing once they uh, once they leave uh, their own country. So that was that was our way of of summarizing really what is uh, what is happening uh, in Central America. But again, in terms of uh, authorities, um, uh, and I think what we um, uh, the the difficulties we had in. Uh, in obtaining certain uh, certain interviews, just goes to show how how complicated uh, the situation is in in Central America and in Mexico, and how um, sensitive also it is for for certain interviewees to to speak uh, about the situation, also about what uh, what the institutions uh, are doing, uh, and so this was. Um, well, complicated in, in Honduras, but also in actually in El Salvador, uh, with the with the current government, uh, it's been very difficult to get uh, to get information or to to get uh, interviews. Really, it's just just generally very difficult to to access information, let alone uh, do filming uh, in this context. And so, um, in Mexico, um, the Coma is there, um, and uh, um, one might wonder, well, uh, if uh, if the head of the asylum agency can speak, why do we not see uh, the uh, the commissioner of the National Migration Institute? Why do we see no one from the uh, Secretaria de Gobernación, the Interior Ministry? Um, uh, that's a uh, that's a valid question. Uh, we did reach out um, to the National Migration Institute in in Mexico, and we we tried until the last moment uh, to get an interview from the commissioner. Um, but uh, that was not possible, uh, unfortunately. So even with the uh, the National Human Rights Commission, um, um, we had to be persistent uh, to to get the interview. Uh, the the de Acho also does not uh, give interviews um, easily. But the unfortunately, the National Migration Institute uh, was more complicated, and we really we tried um, two things. One. Um, was the interview with the with the commissioner, uh, which we did not uh, obtain, uh, and uh, another attempt that we made uh, relates to uh, to the detention centers because um, you would see in in the context of Tapachula that we uh, we wanted to talk about um, migrant detention. Uh, there is the largest uh, migrant detention center is in in Tapachula. This is also where um, where people get um, deported back to uh, to. Central America, uh, but uh, and, and these centers are uh, administered by the the National Migration Institute. Um, but for the for the documentary, again, we were not able to get uh, permission uh, to film or, or even to get into these installations uh, just to talk to people without uh, any filming. So the the added difficulty in that case was that um, the detention centers in Mexico are uh, designated national security. Uh, installations, so it's just generally very difficult for um, human rights defenders, for journalists, for researchers to get into uh, these installations. You need uh, prior permission by the by the National Migration Institute, and often these permissions uh, are being denied. But in our case, it also meant that. Um, we would have liked uh, to use the, the drone. You can see drone images um, in the in the documentary, and we would have liked to use the drone also, at least to uh, to show this detention center in Tapachula uh, from the outside, because this is how we can really appreciate that these are prisons. Um, where people are being uh, detained, where people cannot uh, leave uh, on their on their own accord, um, but this uh, this is not possible either. So the the law also prevents you from from uh, filming or, or taking images of any kind of, uh, of the exterior uh, of these uh, of these installations. But so um, yes, we we did try to. Um, to include different uh, perspectives, uh, different voices, um, but at the end, uh, mm, the individuals and the the institutions we approached uh, uh, decided 
whether or not they, they wanted to, to collaborate. And uh, I think um, those who, who participated uh, were very eloquent in, in explaining uh, what is happening in, in Central America and Mexico and how um, US migration and, and border policies uh, affect Mexico and, and the Central American countries. But uh, it's not always possible um, to include the perspective of, uh, of state institutions. Um, because they, are, um, uh, they have their own way of, um, of managing information, of, of presenting their perspectives. Uh, and uh, actually, we had also um, approached the, the Border Patrol uh, in the United States, but the, the problem was, was similar. They're simply concerned uh, that um, the information uh, they share will, will subsequently uh, used in a, in a critical manner. And this is not how uh, institutions like the Border Patrol or, or the National Migration Institute in Mexico want to come across. They, they want to have control over the information that's being shared. Yeah, before I, I ask a question to Juan Carlos that comes from Jose Miguel. So in the case of Mexico, this is seen or approach from a national security perspective? Yes, this is a contradiction that is uh, in the in the migration law uh, at the moment. The, the law was reformed uh, a few years ago. Actually, until then, Mexico did not have uh, a migration law as such, only a general population uh, law, because Mexico was long seen as a country of emigration, where Mexicans themselves left uh, for the United States, but there was less concern with migrants coming uh, to the United States. Uh, and um, civil society uh, activism by, by NGOs and also by, by shelters eventually led uh, to, the, to the adoption of a new uh, migration law. Uh, and this is, uh, the law is considered in advance uh, in, uh, in, in Mexico, it's, it's considered an improvement, uh, but there are still certain uh, contradictions. And one of the, the main contradictions really relates to um, to this discourse about human rights, because the Mexican state wants to be perceived as respecting uh, the rights of migrants. But on the other hand, there's very clearly also the national uh, security um, perspective. Yeah, and, and this also relates to, uh, to the actors who can uh, perform roles in, in migration control. So officially it's the, the National Migration Institute that is in charge of migration controls. But uh, previously, uh, the federal police, for example, uh, could participate also in immigration controls. These are, uh, well, they were armed police officers. The, the federal police uh, has been abolished by the current government, but now there's a national guard. Uh, and uh, this is uh, really a, a security agency uh, that is that includes uh, members of the of the armed forces. So again, the we have this problem that. Um, the national security perspective really uh, is how how migration is being uh, perceived, and this also really opens the door for for armed state agents uh, to participate in migration control. And uh, at the same time, this this increases also the uh, the risks for uh, for migrants. Mm. Now, if the national uh, guard is involved and the military, in a sense, are involved as well, what about the intelligence services? We don't hear uh, that much about um, uh, intelligence agency, not the uh, the formal state intelligence uh, agency that that exists uh, in Mexico. Unfortunately, this is not uh, not very uh, transparent. But we know that um, uh, that that this can be subsumed in in what is considered security assistance uh, to Mexico, uh, the Merida Initiative, for example, that that existed uh, as security cooperation between the United States uh, and Mexico includes uh, or has included funding um, not just for security agencies for border control, but also for uh, for the National Migration uh, Institute. Uh, but this is this kind of assistance generally is, is not very transparent, so it's difficult uh, to tell where the money uh, exactly uh, goes. But I wouldn't um, I wouldn't say that the problem is um, is only with the the involvement or not uh, of of the the state intelligence agency. Uh, Mm, because the uh, the armed forces themselves also can can carry out um, uh, the, their own intelligence uh, activities. Right. 
Uh, the next question uh, is for Juan Carlos. Uh, the vertical border seems to be taller for some refugees than others. Uh, one reason is obviously politics and foreign policy. What would be other reasons? Does the migration bureaucratic apparatus establish its priorities independent of domestic policies? Well, actually, in, can I answer or, or make a couple of quick points on, on something? Um, you yeah, mentioned the Yeleras. Um, uh, one of the things in the US, one of the ways that you control population in a prison uh, or in a detention center is by keeping it very cold. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way that you, you, you kind of lower tensions in a way, but you're controlling uh, the population in the facility, which leads me to the next one about euphemisms and, and uh, the comments that you've made now in detention center versus prison. And uh, here in the US, you have some facilities uh, my favorite is in a place called Lumpkin, Georgia, that uh, the state of Georgia uh, has a prison that, that it, it's rented or, or given or sold or whatever to Corrections Corporation of America, which changed its name to Core Civic. But my joke was if it wasn't good enough for the state of Georgia, but it's good enough to hold immigration detainees. But literally, it's a prison, but now they no longer call it a prison. It's a detention facility. Uh, and so it's interesting that it, multiple countries do this. Understanding, and this leads to, in part, to the next answer kind of a comment, leads to the answer to what Jose Miguel was asking, that uh, one of the problems that happens is that there are little steps, little mechanical steps or little standards that are used to block people. So the excuse that sometimes is used in I blame uh, significantly, and my colleagues in, in human rights uh, know how, know my feelings quite well because there isn't a conference where I don't say it, um, where uh, human rights reporters cannot excuse governments. Uh, the, the, the constant excuse of the, po the alleged poverty of a government to be able to not control uh, persecutors or torturers uh, or the mistreatment and my and like I, re I represent a lot of people who are meant severely mentally ill and there's always the excuse oh we would if we could um, or people who are LGBT uh, oh we would if we could or women who are victims of domestic violence oh we would if we could but the oh we would if we could excuse is too many times um, sort of oh it's a poor country and that's nonsense that's just nonsense and we cannot excuse any country because on the other side, the US immigration system, what it does is that if a government is trying, but it's not, it's, if they can reduce it to general conditions of violence, if they can reduce it to, uh, to uh, uh, poverty, if they can reuse it, reduce it to criminality, um, if, if you think of the gangs, and the gangs are basically multinational political organizations that are in, in, in some instances uh, in charge of certain local systems, but the U.S. government will not accept that. The U.S. government, it, it should. They are what they are. They're terrorist organizations. And the answer is, why, why not accept it? Because if you do, then there's a political function to that rather than a criminal function. And so instances like this or little steps like this are used uh, to uh, uh, one of my uh, one of my favorite absurdities is that even though you're essentially socially branded uh, when you are a victim of a certain crime, we'll say rape. Uh, well, there's one of the legalistic ideas is, well, you're, you're, you're the damage you suffered, the crime you suffered cannot be used as a characteristic to justify your being uh, a, uh, a, 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 quali a member of a particular social group, which is one of the categories that would give you protection. So then it's reduced to, oh no, it's just individual criminal activity. And it, even though socially it makes you a cognizably um, more vulnerable person within X society, no, 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 we won't do that. And so Tools like this are used for certain populations. And uh, as to Jose Miguel's issue, one of the questions, one of the important things is that we have to remember that only in the 1960s did the Western Hemisphere quota uh, get changed. The, we have to remember that there was always restrictionist immigration 
from we'll call it the global south or call it the western hemisphere, the western hemisphere south of the border. Uh, but then even refugee, um, the Refugee Act of 1980, there weren't regulations implementing it until 1990. And even then, there is there some are we're all equal, some more than others. Well, the issue is there are people who go well. The definition of refugees. Why don't we? Um, why don't we bring everybody in as a refugee? And the answer is, well, the definition is actually very restrictive, but you'll find in some instances that it's generally applied more generously. Uh, in other words, it's more flexible given circumstances uh, and given who the applicants are. So that uh, people from Africa, people from parts of Asia, people from South America or Latin America uh, are held to a different standard uh, than people. And I mean, I arguably, uh, you, I'll give you an example. All Ukrainians in Ukraine are arguably possible refugees within the definition of refugee because they are uh, in all, the Russian military is something the Ukrainian government cannot control. So re a refugee is someone who is a victim of persecution or would be reasonably a victim of persecution on the part of the government, someone the government controls, someone the government cannot control because of their race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or particular social group. In other words, immutable characteristics that you cannot or change or should not have to change, but that they have to be cognizable within the society. You, Ukrainians in the Ukraine are arguably all potential refugees, right? The issue is that, bring it back to El Salvador and to Guatemala, constantly, constantly, uh, you had the use of the concept of general domestic, of general violence. And, and general violence is, you had people, uh, one of my horrible cases, I remember was a family that there was a battle between the Salvadoran army and the FMLN on their farm. Several family members died. And the decision was, this is tragic, but they are collateral damage. They were not targeted because of their opinion or because of their characteristics. It's just, and the answer was, if they were from somewhere else, would they have been treated differently? Um, and the answer is more than likely yes. And so the, the issue is not just the law. And one of the things that I hope in, in, with films like yours that raise consciousness is that I really hope that immigrants in, in the diaspora uh, really understand that it's possible to change the laws. It's possible to get judges who interpret the law fairly, but if you are indifferent, and sadly, uh, it's the same thing as remittances. Remittances for consumer products, yes. Remittances for building society, no. <laughs> and the answer is, if we don't work together, if we don't work, pardon the word, collectively, um, the, uh, it's, we're not going to move forward. Uh, and uh, it's important that messages like yours continue to be out there because of what I mentioned earlier, that people forget US history, people forget um, history in El Salvador, in Guatemala, uh, in Honduras, in Nicaragua, uh, in Mexico. Uh, Mexico to this day persecutes. Uh, we know the populations that are persecuted. And yet uh, you have governments controlling the message and human rights organizations, human in uh, understanding that different human rights organizations folk have different priorities, prisoners of conscience, or whatever is in fashion at the moment. Uh, but honestly, we need to hold governments accountable and say, no, this is not right. Uh, you can call you the, the gentleman who quite an amazing person, you can tell the one who brought up the point of the euphemisms. Uh, it's like, yes, in your face, you can call it what you will, it's a prison. By the way, you don't get invited to meetings with the government when you say, oh, this is a prison. Um, I can tell you. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I answered, Jose, you get answer question. Any follow-up comment, um, Sonia? 
Perhaps um, to, to build a little on what uh, Juan Carlos said about um, consciousness raising, uh, I think I would uh, like to to add a little bit about um, uh, what we uh, what we hope to achieve with this documentary and where we where we see it uh, going. So of course, uh, raising the visibility. Um, of the issues is important. We wanted to talk specifically about uh, forced migration and, and get away from this idea that um, uh, that there are refugees and asylum seekers and internally displaced persons who, who might be seen as, uh, as as worthier of assistance and protection versus uh, voluntary or, or economic migrants who, uh, as Donald Trump once said, uh, are just poor people and the United States can't help all the poor people so let's deport them back to their countries of origin uh, but really what the what the film uh, wants to wants to do is uh, on the one hand um, make this more visible show why uh, why there are people who feel that there is no alternative to migration but also to to show how countries um, that sometimes have uh, have played a role in the in the instability that exists in the countries of origin, uh, for example, in in the Central American countries, uh, how uh, how these countries then react when when people who are fleeing come come knocking uh, on their doors, right? What what are the the strategies they get implemented just to to keep out uh, migrants who are who are not wanted? Uh, but this really leads us um, to uh, to what we might do with this with this documentary, of course, when we talk about um, the problems that that exist in that exist in Central America or the, the situation in uh, in Mexico, a question that that always comes up is uh, what now? What what can be done? So we have we have analyzed the, the problems that exist, but people want to know, of course, uh, what what can be done. Uh, and I would say that. Um, in the film, but also um, speaking more more generally, um, I would like to get away a little from from specific policy recommendations. Not because they, they aren't necessary, but because I feel there is already research evidence uh, out there uh, on the situation in uh, in Central America, on uh, the militarization of uh, of security in in Mexico. There's also uh, evidence on on U.S. migration uh, and border policies, or on on asylum uh, procedures in in the United States. All this has been documented uh, already. But I think for me, uh, it is perhaps my my frustration with the with the little change that is happening that that led me to uh, to consider uh, a film uh, such as this one. So rather than uh, a just add more specific policy measures uh, uh, for Central America or for, for Mexico or for the United States, really what I would like people to do with this film is, uh, is to, uh, to reflect uh, on, on what they're seeing and to, to discuss it. Uh, rather than uh, talking to, to policymakers, I see this as a film that can speak to, uh, to citizens, um, who, who should take an, an interest in, in the world around them and who uh, I would like to, uh, to realize that they themselves have a role to play in, in, in building this world. And uh, also the, the, the reason for ending with Todd Miller was really because we, we wanted to put this out there uh, as a reflection. Todd Miller himself said, well, perhaps people might think that this is a, is a utopia. We will never get away from, from borders. It's just uh, the way the world works. But I would say that um, if we don't uh, try to, to imagine a different world, if we, talk, if we don't talk about uh, structural transformations that are needed, if we don't contemplate different ways of, of relating to other human beings, this, this world will never come into existence. So I think the, the film uh, can, can serve uh, for reflection, but it can also be an opportunity for greater civic engagement. I think um, citizens should not simply expect uh, governments or, or state institutions uh, to do something for them, uh, but the, the change that we would all like to see will, will not come about if citizens 
uh, don't don't demand it. So I would uh, with this film. I would really like to to stir something in people. I would like people to to take something away from it and to to ask themselves uh, what they can do. Uh, and in that sense, the the decision to include um, the Habesha project that you saw in in the Mexican city of Aguascalientes was um, an example that that can also um, get people to to think a little bit uh, about what I what I just said. The Habesha project is a uh, is a small uh, local initiative. Uh, they, they try to create um, higher education opportunities for refugees. And of course, uh, what they can do is, is very limited in the face of the, the magnitude uh, of the um, uh, of the displacement that exists in the world. But this is an example of, um, of uh, Mexican citizens, uh, they're also uh, also immigrants working for this group now, but it started as a as a group of Mexican citizens who decided um, that the Mexican government did not do enough uh, for for refugees and they they did not uh, they decided not to uh, to spend their time on on direct advocacy, but to get involved in, in their own uh, initiative. And again, one might say, well, perhaps say uh, they are doing the the work that the Mexican government should be doing in in terms of uh, providing um, uh, uh, really responses to uh, to the refugees uh, that are out there. But this is just one example of citizens who who are decided to get uh, involved. And of course, this is just one example. But what I would uh, like to to leave as a message is that. Uh, I think it's it's up to all of us uh, to to take an interest uh, in the world and in the situation uh, of other, of other human beings. Uh, what we're seeing, uh, forced migration, uh, the inequalities that exist in the world are not far away problems. They also uh, concern us in in transit countries and in destination countries, and we also, uh, in in some way may even be playing a, a role uh, in the inequalities that that exist uh, in the in the global south so i think we, we cannot simply say these are distant problems they have nothing to do with our lives but i think we we should uh, try to find out more about what is happening to uh, to the forced migrants um, out there and try to see what what we can do either um, uh, through uh, perhaps social media campaigns or or uh, pressuring uh, legislators or, or the government to uh, really to um, to respond differently to forced migrants. We have uh, less than uh, four minutes or four, mi four minutes and a half. Uh, my final question would be, do you see or foresee any change in the United States administration policy towards immigration in the near future? When it comes to uh, to expectations of change, I'm afraid I'm I'm rather um, pessimistic, um, but I also have to say, uh, even before uh, Joe Biden became president, I was um, I was not very optimistic about um, about uh, his administration's um, policies. I I did not um, expect. Uh, um, deep changes uh, to begin with. Uh, and I think what, what we're seeing now um, reminds us that uh, there may be um, intentions, uh, governments maybe um, may want to implement different policies in an ideal world, but we don't, we don't live uh, in ideal world really. Um, when we think about the implementation of policies, we, we find all sorts of uh, obstacles, not, not just related to uh, to resource limitations, perhaps to also to, to institutional habits uh, that have developed uh, over time, but often it is uh, political and, and electoral considerations that also influence um, policies. So I, I would I would think that um, in the near future, we, we cannot uh, expect a, a, a change of direction uh, in policies, but again, I, I would say this uh, this shouldn't be seen in a in a deterministic uh, manner. If, if we just close the door to to policy change, then uh, 
probably there, there will be no policy change. Uh, again, uh, th this links to uh, to my previous comment. We we need to uh, keep working on changes. We need to 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 pressure for things to change uh, because if we don't, then things are certainly not not going to change. So. Um, while I'm not not optimistic about uh, changes with this administration, either domestically domestically or towards Mexico or Central America, I think the the challenge is to uh, to um, to put our voices out there and to 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 speak about uh, the situation of of migrants. In doing that, where can we promote your film? Thank you. That's a, that's an important uh, question. Uh, I think uh, generally um, uh, it would be great if um, if the documentary uh, would find uh, audiences at, at universities, schools, perhaps even uh, community centers. Uh, we have created a, a microsite uh, where the documentary uh, is accessible actually uh, free of charge because we considered uh, an educational tool um, at the moment uh, i'm also trying to promote it uh, at film festivals so the the public promotion is a little a little bit more limited because i would like to see what, what we can achieve uh, at film festivals in order to um to shine a greater light uh, on mm -hmm. this film but of course the um the the documentary is already um out there and um um it would be great uh, at at universities uh, especially perhaps in in the united states uh if uh, if the documentary could be could be shown actually the work of Juan carlos also reminds me that uh there could be an, an audience also in the uh in the legal community uh legal aid clinics perhaps might might find the film also uh interesting so um we, we've just uh really just finished uh, the documentary we've had some um virtual uh, presentations already but we're, we're still in the early stages of the of the promotion so the microsite is available already or you want to it's available already and where is that I can uh, I can send you uh, the link, but uh, it's really on the uh, if you Google Proyecto Habesha, uh, the organization uh, that was featured uh, also in the film. Uh, since Habesha collaborated really in in the making uh, of this film, they were so uh, so generous as to to create a, a microsite uh, on their own uh, website. So if you look up uh, the Habesha project, Proyecto Habesha, you will find it uh, in the menu. Very good. Any final comment, uh, Juan Carlos? I'm concerned about the causes. I don't see I don't see much hope in the causes immediately, mm -hmm. and anticipate in May. Um, there's it's already been announced by the Biden administration that um, a new mechanism will be used for processing claims for asylum, um, starting in May, basically, on, on an expedited removal basis. Uh, where asylum officers will be quickly deciding these cases um, and they're planning on hiring hundreds if not thousands of asylum applicants and so one of the things that happens is that uh, fast justice is not always justice because most people can't get legal assistance and most people have no idea what they're supposed to be raising uh, and so a lot of people who should be protected, who must be protected, will not be, um, whereas others might. Uh, but I don't see, um, I, I'm not optimistic uh, in, in terms of overall changes in policy, uh, because uh, sadly, I, while I think that some uses of social media and such are important, one of the things that happens is that we end up with chatter. Um, and once you get to those heroes that you showed at those shelters, uh, those face reality on a daily basis, uh, whereas others uh, sort of delete their little um, emails or their uh, posts uh, and, and they don't do anything. Uh, they don't even show up to vote sometimes. Uh, and so I, I'm hoping that I'm proven wrong um, and that they do change and that they start taking action and that they actually, um, I, I saw in, in the people at these shelters and these advocates, 
as people who see the humanity of others uh, in the importance of doing that and not just otherizing others or being xenophobic, if you will, uh, but otherizing it would be more, would be, let's just say broader. Thank you for including me and inviting me. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Juan Carlos, for your comment. Thank you, Sonia. It's a great film. We wish you luck in the film festivals, which are excellent for promoting the film. We will do whatever we can in promoting uh, the, the vertical border in associations uh, that we participate in. Perhaps the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, they have their assembly in August. Uh, if you want, I can promote that uh, with them so that we have uh, a presentation during our event in, um, in Las Vegas in uh, early August. So that's something that we can do. And also, whenever you say, uh, promoting it through, through uh, Twitter and Instagram and all our uh, social media pages. And uh, with that, uh, thank you to you both. And uh, I'll give the microphone to uh, Jose Miguel. Thank you, Jose Miguel, for the invitation. And uh, was an excellent conference, as always, uh, high level. And um, thank you very much. Gracias, Alejandro. Thank you, Alejandro. I want to thank you for, for moderating this, 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 uh, this discussion. Also, to Juan Carlos Gomez, who always says yes to us uh, and participate in all, all of these events. And obviously, also to Sonia Wolf uh, for allowing us to uh, showcase her, her film, her important film. When, when, when I talked to Sonia, to Sonia, uh, some weeks ago about the possibility to have this, this, this film. She said something that resonated to me and she said something like, well, you know, we, we, we spend our lives uh, writing academic papers on these issues, right? And, and that's what we academics do, right? We, you know, we write these papers and, and, and few people read those papers, right? I mean, uh, sometimes nobody reads those papers and they have almost zero impact on anything on policy. So that's why she decided to make, to make this, this film, uh, which, is, which really summarizes so many things of, of the complex phenomenon around Around the around migration, around um, you know around refugees and human rights, so 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 I take that also that with that spirit uh, that was the spirit of the of this conference that one day and a half conference I mean uh, to to provide a space to to talk to speak about these important issues right uh, from uh, from the uh, taking into consideration very much the human perspective, the, the, the people's perspective of the suffering in, in migration. So that was the whole spirit of the, of, of, of the conference that we started today. And, and the film basically is a great, uh, is a great uh, a cierre, a closing for all this, 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 this effort. So thank you, thank you all of you. I want to uh, take this moment also to thank all the, 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 the panelists that participated uh, yesterday, the people who, who, who attended. This is an effort initiative that we expect to do every year in a, with a hemispheric uh, view uh, here from LAC. Uh, so this is our you know, first, uh, first year doing this. We're going to continue doing this year after year expanding and, 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 trying to, and trying to bring more voices for, for this discussion and to get a little bit closer uh, to, the year, to the years of the people who, to, who, 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 who take decisions. Uh, we hope that, you know, that you know, at some point, at some point, somebody will listen. So, so, so thank you, thank you all. I want also to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues here at, at LAC, uh, uh, the staff president Solis for supporting this effort from the from the very beginning. Uh, obviously, it all, uh, to Lindsay Dudley who has worked tirelessly to do this, along also with Lourdes Sosa 
el Fakir and the general staff in, in LAC. And thank you all for, for this, uh, for all this support and for the possibility to, to, to do this. And again, thank you, Sonia, uh, Juan Carlos, uh, Alejandro, for a great discussion. So this concludes our, 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 our conference. And with that, uh, I'll see you soon, everybody. So thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.